So when we look at the Oka, the Oki is out of the way. Um, there are pros and cons to it. Of course, it, you, know, you don't have to sit the exam, which is great. But the skills in the Oki are invaluable for your future, because that's really what you'll be doing day in, day out. So it still means I would suggest that you really do think about formulation management all the time. And how do you actually formulate? Um, and what are the skills for formulation and, and, and for management as well? But this is a useful quote because this is from the book by Kahneman and he says a general law of least effort applies to cognitive as well as physical exertion. The law asserts that if there are several ways of achieving the same goal, people will eventually gravitate to the least demanding course of action. In the economy of action, effort is a cost and the acquisition of skill is driven by the balance of benefits and costs. So you are going to be constantly weighing up, you know, should I do this? Shouldn't I do this? And ultimately, what you've got to do is get the best return on an effort. There's no doubt about it. So have a careful think about where you put your, your effort in order to extract maximum value. There's no doubt about that. That is something that you have to consider carefully. So, and to give you an example, candidates often say, I'm going to spend my X months finishing Kaplan and Sadok. Okay? Now, is that the best return on effort? Is a real question you've got to ask. Because the skill set that you need to know for the EMQ, for example, is psychopathology. Kaplan and Sadok isn't necessarily the best for psychopathology. Um, psychopharmacology, okay? Kaplan and Sadok isn't the best for it. So you might actually know Kaplan and Sadok in and out, but it isn't necessarily going to help you pass the EMQ. Okay? So it's about picking up a little bit from everywhere. Okay, so Lishman, you don't have to read the whole book. But there are certain chapters in Lishman that will give you a lot of information that will be very valuable for later on. So that's essentially what the, the return on effort that you've got to think about. And this is obviously useful in life generally. So this is from his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, as you know, is a Nobel Prize winner. And he also talks about this other, and this is a really important quote, intelligence is not only the ability to reason, it is also the ability to find relevant material in memory and to deploy attention when needed. And this is, becomes particularly important when you're approaching clinical scenarios, MEQs in your clinical practice, OCAs, OCIs. It's not about recency bias, just because what happens is we all succumb to recency bias. What's the first thing that I've seen yesterday? That's the first thing that will come to mind. And we've got to try to avoid that. We've got to look at what the evidence is in front of us and actually deduce things from that. And that is true intelligence. So it's not about knowing just the knowledge. It's about being able to pull out relevant facts based on evidence. Because ultimately what you're trying to do is to become a better decision maker. And this is so, so valuable because I'll tell you how to develop each of these. The better decision maker has at his or her disposal repertoires of possible actions. And that's what you've got to do in your MEQs, repertoires of possible actions. Same thing on the clinical practice. I've got five different ways. I do a risk benefit for each one. What path do I take? Okay? Checklists of things to think about before he acts. That's your OSCE. OSCE is all about checklists. Because when you're assessing someone for body dysmorphic disorder, there is a checklist. There are certain things that you just have to do. And having a checklist at the back of the mind means that you can focus on doing things smoothly. But if anything out of the ordinary comes, you can focus your attention there. You're not burdened because your checklist has gone into your working memory. You're used to doing it. And he has mechanisms in his mind to evoke these and bring these to his conscious attention when the situations for decisions arise. It's a very, very, very powerful quote because it's actually what you will find in the OSCE. And in the OSCE, most people, it's, it's, a, it's, it's actually an easy exam to get through because what you need is practice. But what you need is you need to practice the right way, 
right? And in order to practice the right way, you've got to know the checklist. And if you keep a checklist in mind for all scenarios, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you some of the scenarios later on, but if you have a checklist for all scenarios, it becomes really, really easy. CanMeds is nothing but a checklist, isn't it? So start thinking about the CanMeds for every single patient that you've seen. It'll take you, after a while, literally in two minutes, you'll have four or five themes. And just having that from the beginning, I personally really wish you know, so the CanMeds was something that I had right from the beginning. Because it, it, it only came, it sort of comes as you sort of become a consultant. That's when you sort of realize, oh, I've got to start thinking this way. Fortunately, Ranzap, you know, specifies it, which is a good thing. So what are you trying to do clinically? You're trying to get a biopsychosocial understanding, biopsychosocial cultural even, and then develop a strategy. That is what you're doing day-to-day -day life. That's your formulation, that's your management plan. So the four questions that matter is, again, a very, very useful way of thinking, is what is the problem? You're not asking what's the diagnosis. What's the problem? And that problem could be relationships, as I sh gave you some examples of patients. That could be relationships, could be finances, could be accommodation problems, could be cognitive issues, could be all sorts of things. So that's what this is, not the diagnosis. As Osler says, you know, ask not what disease the person has, but what person the disease has. Right? So that's what it, it's all about. Next, why has the patient developed this problem? That's your formulation. That's your predisposing, perpetuating, um, precipitating factors. And I'll show you the formulation matrix because it's actually not just these three factors. You've got to think a little bit broader. How do I solve the problem? And that's where you're thinking about your strategy. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a six domain management plan as well. And then what are the resources available and what barriers will I face? This is probably the most relevant question. And what happens is, this is something that as registrars, we're not used to kind of having to dis uh, even think about on a daily basis because it's sort of the responsibility is not necessarily you know, yours in a way to think about the resources or the barriers. But that is what comes when you go into private practice because you're sort of on your own or with a group of individuals, but what if the person is not that unwell, but you feel needs time out because they've got family stresses. So you can't admit them to the public hospital because public hospitals are busy and from a risk perspective, possibly they won't go in. So you've got to think about what's the interim bit? You know, what are the interim aspects that I can, can I arrange a, a follow up through the public health system? Or can I consider, do they have private insurance? If they don't have private insurance, that's private hospitals out of the equation. So uh, can I get a public hospital nurse, for example, to follow up? Okay. So you've got to kind of think about the interim. If that's not possible, a patient says, no, I don't want that. What's the next thing that can come across? Because that's where those barriers in, uh, create real issues. Someone doesn't want to engage. What resources? If you're working in a rural area, you know, you might not have teams around. So say for example when we, I was working in uh, Western Australia or in Darwin, I worked at Alice Springs. Alice Springs, good example. I had a patient that was severely, severely manic. Okay? The seclusion rooms were, I think they were being built or they were not being utilized at that point. But this person was severe risk. Okay? Now the, the closest secure mental health unit is a flight to Adelaide. But flying them to Adelaide, this might have changed now, this was about three, four years ago. But to fly them, can you think, it, they're going to have, need anesthesia. So I've then got to think about the medication intervention that I need to consider. It's a different, completely different question as opposed to someone here that is very, very acutely agitated. So in Alice Springs as well, there was, there's an occasion when a traditional healer used to be called in. In, uh, for, for certain agitated patients. And it's amazing how things can work differently. So with this person, you know, different things. So intramuscular haloperidol, um, 
And one's got to be careful with acuphase as well, because with acuphase, indigenous population, uh, neuroleptic naive, and these are questions that come up in the EMQ as well. You know, if something, the risk of uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome is quite high, right? So all of those factors, the resources aren't there. So I've got to, you, one's got to think about other uh, aspects. The other bit is if you do consider transporting them somewhere else, remember that they're away from their family as well. How long for? So all of these things come in, and they're very, very important aspect because that's traumatic for them to be away from the family considering a collectivistic environment, a collectivistic culture where family plays such an important role and they're transported somewhere miles and hundreds of miles away where they've never been. So sometimes that happens from, say, Kimberley in Western Australia where they might get transported to Perth. Family can't visit, completely different environment, never been to Perth, for example. It's, it, it can be a real, real um, traumatic sort of scenario. Okay, so those are some of the things to, to sort of think about and you can see how these questions come up in the MEQs. So have a think about these questions every time you see a patient. Okay.